Well, thank you, Dell and Leah, Zoe, everyone who's participated today in leading us in worship. Good morning. So glad to be with you on this day back on campus. We continue our sermon ser series titled, The Crosses We Bear. But I remind you, if you're visiting for the first time, if you're online, you must know that you are welcomed, that you are loved, that you are safe, and that God is well pleased with you. It was a Thursday evening at Alegría, which means joy in Spanish. A Salvation Army facility in the Silver Lake area of Los Angeles, houseless families and individuals struggling with HIV and AIDS were placed at this facility. And as the sun set, the prayer and sharing meeting commenced. The room filled up with people from diverse backgrounds, languages, colors, genders, and identities. But the one commonality among the people was their trauma. Trauma with lack of housing, with lack of wealth, with lack of resources. And as the chaplain started the evening with a call to prayer, in English and Spanish, he said, Here you will meet God and one another. You have come to the right place, an open space, a safe space. For the next hour and a half, the group would listen and share. A part of their story, a part of their trauma, their pains and sufferings, their experience with rejection from the church, from so-called Christians. There was much weeping, but there was also much laughter and much joy by the end of this meeting. Every meeting felt like a healing session. People left lighter with hope, with joy, somehow encouraged to go forward in life. I can share these details with you because I had the privilege and honor to be the chaplain of such beautiful times. I made so many long-time friends and relationships, people who still call me. My love somehow expanded so much, my grace extended so far, my understanding of friends took on a whole new meaning. There was just this genuine and organic spirit to the meetings. And Many of those individuals and families actually ended up in my congregation. I would leave each meeting so full, so full to the brim of joy, of hope, so blessed, so grateful, so thankful to be a part of it, because I truly felt attached to the kingdom of God. It was like something was in the room, something about these people forever changed me. You know, I share this story with you today because I believe it speaks in today's parable. I've titled today's sermon, The Alegria of Friendship. Today's passage, you know, it's one of the most difficult parables to interpret. So I'm going to give it my best shot. Confusing. Very confusing. You're right, Leah. This is a, a parable, and I'll just kind of state the facts, of a rich man a rich owner who has a manager, but his manager had embezzled his wealth. And when he was caught, knowing that soon he would lose his position, he still attempts to fix the whole thing by wheeling and dealing dishonestly. And the rich man, the rich owner, finds out about it and applauds the manager's shrewd and slick and sly dealings. Right? Go, cool, good job. But let me pause here, because you must know something. Most of Jesus' parables are about respectable people, about those who we should imitate. However, this parable is about those who are not so admirable, right? But yet I wonder, is this parable about paying attention so not to become that person with no friends? What am I talking about? Although this manager has not yet been fired, he is on notice. 
His possessions will soon be taken away. His wheeling and dealing will come to an end because in this world, nothing is permanent. Everything is temporary. What is this parable about? Is it about accountability? Is it about one's personal administration, one's personal oversight? And here, before we move forward, I think is where wisdom enters the room. Here is where we ask the Trinitarian God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, to come and speak to us, to come and move in us, to come and guide us and heal us and, you know, perhaps speak into us. Whatever you come with, whatever's on your heart, on your mind, this is the moment that if we truly believe that the divine is in this space, then let's open ourselves up so that the divine can speak, so that the creator can lead us, so that the voice of the Holy Spirit can truly counsel us and comfort us this morning. Because today's wisdom places a rich man at the center of this parable. And although Jesus' audience uh, consisted mostly of men, okay, disciples and Pharisees, I think one must acknowledge women were also disciples. And women were also rich in antiquity. And although this parable points to radical messages about the use of money, yet another parable, right, where Jesus is uh, mentioning money. In fact, 11 out of 39 parables from Jesus, roughly 30% of Jesus' parables mention money. Not always directly about handling money, but uses money to illustrate another motif. Why? Why would Jesus use money as a method of teaching, as a method of pedagogy? Why would Jesus use that? Perhaps Jesus was speaking to affluent people, to people with means. Perhaps I'm speaking to afflu affluent people, to people with means this morning. You see, Jesus knew his people. But the universal teaching here transcends the rich, transcends the poor, transcends time and space. See, the teaching I believe this morning, the wisdom, is that any attachment to wealth, riches, possessions are incompatible with the attachment to Jesus and his kingdom. I'm going to repeat that. That any attachment to wealth, riches, and possessions are incompatible with the attachment to Jesus and his kingdom. What if this parable is about using money to make friends? Let me say something about this, because Jesus said it. I don't know if you caught it. He said, I tell you, which by the way, anytime you read this in scripture, the words, I tell you, it actually should be translated as, learn from this. So Jesus says, learn from this, right? I tell you, I know we got to, deep dives in here into scripture. Make friends for yourselves, which is referring not only to make friends yourselves right now, but it's an eternal friendship. By means of dishonest wealth, he's not saying that go ahead and use unrighteous wealth. In fact, what he's trying to see, say is be faithful even in this, to use one's resources to further the work of God on earth. So when it is gone, when it runs out, right? They may welcome you into the eternal homes. They. Who's that? It's probably referring to those whose eternal home is the kingdom of God. But let me make a point here. A little bit about friendship in antiquity. The Greco-Roman world was, had a particular view about friendship. Greco uh, and Roman philosophers discussed this often. But for them, friendship was this intimate, affectionate relationship that derived from shared values. In other words, from these shared beliefs. They needed to believe alike. Love for friends was the freest of all types of love, marked by selflessness, pure motives, and hospitality. But this kind of love was between people of the same social status, of the same economic status. Do you remember what Jesus called his disciples at one point? 
He called them friends. But when Jesus made friends, it was quite different, right? Than the, Roman, uh, the Greco-Roman world. Jesus modeled holy friendship by eating with tax collectors, by eating with sinners. Jesus made friends by inviting the poor, the blind, the hungry, those with disabilities to dine at his party. And so the characteristics of a friendship, of a Jesus friendship, shall we say, centered on compassion, centered on forgiveness, and wait for it, detachment from wealth. (laughs) Did you hear me? Detachment from wealth. Those who detach themselves from wealth, possession, riches, do so because it can lead to a way of life that is unjust for others. You see, Jesus' approach to friendship brings together those who are vastly different, who are from different economic statuses, different social statuses. Jesus' understanding of friendship places those who would never dare to be in the same room. Friendship for Jesus unites the unlikely, brings together those that society says should not be together. In this friendship, the hungry are fed, the poor are cared for, the needy are served. And when the riches and wealth runs out, when it is all gone, because again, everything is temporary, the friends made among the poor, the hungry, and the needy will assure all the Jesus students an eternal welcome into their home, the kingdom of God, the basilia of God. To whom belongs the kingdom of God? Right? That's the question. It belongs to the poor, to those who are mourning this morning, to the meek, to the pure in heart, to the peacemakers, to those who are being persecuted, insulted, mistreated, and abused. See, to be friends with those people, now that, that right there is faithfulness in the smallest of things. I think what I'm trying to submit to you this morning is a question, really. Who are your friends? Are your friends only the rich and wealthy, the well-connected, the highly educated? Or are your friends the poor, the mistreated also, the ones who are neglected, abused, uh, oppressed? Are those also your friends? Because I think what we're wrestling with here today is to understand that those who are true friends of God are able to reach across the boundaries that separate us and what are and make friends with those on the other side and I think of what are the boundaries well there's racial boundaries ethnic boundaries gender identity boundaries there's tax bracket boundaries there is political ideologies that are different I mean, there are so many things that separate us. And yet, they're separating us because they are unjust, unequal, unbalanced, out of sorts, shall we say. And when we realize that God will always stand, always side, always stand in solidarity with the poor, with the oppressed, with the mistreated, with the abused, we also should be reminded to do the same. Can I get an amen to that? And I think that this morning, when we think about friendship, hopefully we're starting to think of where do we go from here? Think about it. What is a people group that is being oppressed right now? Mistreated right now? Exploited right now? Abused right now, used for gain and profit today. You said it, Leah. The immigrants, the migrants from Central and South America, placed on buses and planes from Florida, Arizona, and Texas, sent with false promises, with maps that are impossible to follow for someone who is new to any country, especially for people with limited education. How can one use beautiful and vulnerable people for political gain or for political messaging? 
These are human beings made in the image of God, not some piece of mail, not some UPS package or Amazon package that can be repackaged and returned never to be seen again. These are people, not things. The inhumanity, the, the heartless, the cruelty, the uncompassionate, the disgusting acts of politicians and state governors. Shame on you. The audacity, the nerve, the mitigated gall to attempt to remove the image of God from the faces of these people. How would we respond to such a thing? What if you were on that bus? What if you were on that plane? And yet the most lovely thing is the response of these migrants. Do you know what the response of these travelers in search of a better life was? For those who are at Martha's Vineyard, as the evening fell upon them, they played soccer. They hung out in small groups on the porch of their temporary shelter. And when I first read this, my eyes were quickly watered up, I watered up just like they're doing right now. But within minutes of that, uh, those tears turned into smiles. Smiles of joy because you, see, you know something? I, I know exactly what soccer means <laughs> to these migrants, to these people. I know their language. I know their culture. I know the things that give them joy. I smile because it's what we do. We make the best of things. Soccer is like therapy. It's like joy and laughter and fun. It brings hope. It brings peace. We learn to adapt. We naturally embody hospitality. It's in our DNA. But you know what else is in our DNA? We organically make friends. Jesus, the friend of the poor, of the oppressed, of the mistreated, of the exploited and abused, not only carried a cross, but died on the cross takes away our sins and our burdens and mistakes, our failures, our misguided friendships, and gives us his forgiveness, his grace, his successes, his righteousness. And resurrected from the grave on the third day to give us this apex of reality, this omega point of history that I would call it today liberation, freedom, to no longer be attached to the things of this world, to no longer be attached to wealth and riches or possessions, but to be free to value friendships with the poor, with the hopeless, with those who are grieving this morning, weeping this morning, playing soccer this morning. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Those are the eternal friendships that will welcome us to our eternal home. Those are the friends of God. O Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer who was, who is, and who is to come, give us courage to rethink things. Give us hearts that break for those who are exploited and abused. For those who are living in fear this morning, help us to be the friend of the poor and of the needy, to detach ourselves from the things that do not give us life, for the temporary things that do not give us eternal joy. And attach us to you. Attach us to your kingdom that is truly heavenly, truly lovely, and beautiful. Whatever we're looking for, we will find. Help us to look for you. Renew us. Heal us. Let your spirit fall upon us. Let it fall upon us. And let us experience your love and grace. Word of God and word of life, and we all say together, 
Thanks be to God.